gold, silver, and platinum. And their lesser known cousins, palladium and rhodium. For millennia, humanity has coveted the precious metals for both their rarity and their beauty. All in some way being used as both currency and adorning jewelry. But now, in the modern day, we've come to actually depend on these critical elements for the function of our advanced civilization and all of the ease, enlightenment, comfort, freedom, and luxury it's come to allow us. They are key to the functioning of vehicles, lighting, communications, chemical and medicine production, and all computerized technology. And even far more than that. So let's go ahead and start with you watching this video right now on some kind of computerized device upon which you can now also instantly contact and communicate with anyone else anywhere on this earth or research and find any information you want or need in a microsecond. I want you to just at least stop for a real moment and think about the true magnitude of that reality compared to how things were previously for all of human history and well beyond even just your personal uses. Industrial information, emergency information, shipment and freight information can be sent and analyzed instantaneously. Things can be made and sent so fast now because items can be scanned and automatically redirected, inventories are tracked in real time, fingerprint and facial recognition systems can carry out weeks of detective work in minutes. This list could so easily keep going all the way out to the edge of the non-existent flat earth, but for brevity's sake, we'll cut it there. Gold forms the tiny connections between the processors and other components and the circuit board or motherboard of computerized devices, most often seen as those little pins on the underside. Because the amount of actual electricity in electric signals going into and out of processors and the like is so mind-numbingly small of a current through each individual connection, it's microcurrents, nanocurrents. Currents so small and sensitive that the uttermost, most minuscule bit of tarnishing, corrosion, oxidization, or anything of the sort happening to the connection material will interrupt or distort those currents and render the device unfunctional. So for those connections on the underside of processors, RAM, and other things, the material has to be something that's both extremely conductive and something that does not tarnish, that does not corrode, that does not oxidize. And that is what thins out the list, because gold tarnishes not. Not to air, not to water, not even to salt water. Though, of course, you shouldn't be submerging your computer in salt water anyways, or water to begin with, but that's beside the point. Also, don't take a toaster into the water either, or stick a fork into the toaster while it's in the water. I've warned you, okay? Don't do it. Well, I'm an adult, and I can put forks in the toaster in the bathtub. Gold, at least in this specific point from which we're viewing it, is invincible. And for that, gold is the element of choice. And not just for those, but also even for the coding on the connecting surface of computer jacks, plugins, USB slots, and much more. And also, many don't know this part, it is similarly the element chosen for the tiny little microwires connecting to the diodes inside of LEDs. Whether in LED light bulbs you have in your home, or the other LEDs on almost basically every device around you. It is also, to a lesser known extent, extremely good at reflecting heat. So it is used for heat shielding on satellites and communication structures and all kinds of space equipment. Yeah, that shiny gold looking foil-esque 
shielding thing on the outside of most of our satellites. That doesn't just look like gold. Your eyes aren't deceiving you. That actually is gold foil. Similar to how silver near perfectly reflects all visible light, gold near perfectly reflects all heat, all infrared light. Without it, without that gold shielding, those delicate orbiting systems upon which much of our modern infrastructure relies would fry in the direct sunlight of space. Now, silver is also used for many very similar purposes. It is in our electronics and computer devices in drove numbers. Silver composes the external motherboard and circuit board connectors for most of the components. Those little ribs or spider leg like things you see around the outside of the uh, various computer components. Whether they curve downward onto the circuit board or look like they stab straight down into it. It's also used for the little pairs of twin prongs connecting down from some other components like capacitors and such. And for the wire coils inside of most microphones. From phones to laptop mics, recording mics, speakers and comm systems. Silver is also the chosen material for printed and flexible circuit boards, i.e. electronics in RFID anti-theft tags, wearable electronics, bioelectronics, health monitoring systems, stuff like that. Silver is the perfect material, and now silver is also developing a new usage in wireless charging devices, coming in the form of a micro-thin silver cover on top of the resonating wire coil inside of the wireless charging device that allows a much greater efficiency of the wireless transmission. And even outside of complex electronics and into basic electrical systems, silver permeates everywhere as the element of electrical contacts in the ever-present switches all around you. Whether the manual light switches and on-off buttons that you flip or press yourself, or the equally numerous, sometimes more numerous, automated switches inside of every machine and appliance that you never even see. Since silver is both the most conductive element, so it's exceptionally easy for the current to jump and the circuit to close when the contacts are silver, and silver is far more resistant to electrical corrosion than just copper. So whereas if the contact were copper, it would actually wear down from the repeating on-off cycles over time. But silver is often able to go for millions of on-off contact cycles. Then, outside of electrical stuff, silver is still found in every home and every building. In mirrors. It's a very thin layer or sheet of silver applied to the surface of the metal backplate that that allows mirrors to give complete and perfect reflections. Otherwise, if it were just aluminum and tin, it would be all wobbly and blurry, kind of like what you see on the hood of your car. It is a very thin layer of silver on every mirror. And, and, it's also needed, though not used in huge quantities, in hospitals and medical centers, as it's a crucial component for burn treatment creams and even stitching or suture needles used to sew in stitches to close your wounds, those needles themselves are actually silver. And still more, something shared by both your house and the hospital, at least depending on where you live, windows. Many modern windows, especially large windows and windows on large buildings, have a tiny amount of silver mixed into the glass when it's made. That's why you may have noticed modern windows tend to be very reflective. And that's kind of the point. The silver's in there to make them more reflective and help keep more of the sun out, thus not allowing the building to be heated as fast in climate regions where heat is more of a problem than cold. But they keep more of the sunlight out, reducing the rate at which buildings heat up and thus noticeably cutting their need for AC usage or cooling, which thus reduces their energy use. Previously, a lot of silver used to be consumed in the chemical process of developing photography. However, now in the modern day, physical photography is nearly dead, 
because obviously we're using digital cameras now. So the consumption of silver for development of photographs has nearly collapsed. That gap, however, was replaced just as quickly as it appeared and has since been well exceeded by the newly and rapidly rising demand for silver coming from the production of solar panels. Silver is necessary for solar panels to be effective, to be efficient, because silver is the most electrically conductive material and the use of it inside of solar panels is what allows all of those tiny little currents generated by the individual solar cells to actually collect together and add up into an electrical current of some amount that's actually meaningful and useful. Now, we finally come to the end of silver's list. Silver definitely had the longest. Now, when we get to platinum, for platinum, as well as palladium and rhodium also, as they're both platinum group metals, the largest source of their consumption is for the catalyst material inside of catalytic converters. Catalytic converters being those things on the underside of your car that chemically neutralize the parts of the exhaust that would otherwise make it pure toxic smog. And the chemical reactions that take care of that have to be catalyzed by platinum group metals. So they are forced through that device and forced throughout a web comb structure made out of cerium ceramic. Cerium being something called a rare earth metal. Don't worry, they'll get their own video eventually in the future. The surface of which is coated in platinum group metals. And now, as of 2019, with about 80 million or more new vehicles being sold in the world every year. Catalytic converters make up the plain and clear majority of platinum consumption. Each individual catalytic converter on each car, or any other vehicle for that matter, containing anywhere from 3 to 7 grams of platinum group metals. Basically, the more strict of an emissions regulation the vehicle was built under, such as vehicles built in Europe, the more platinum group metals will be in the catalytic converter. Also, the newer the vehicle is, the more platinum group metals will be in the catalytic converter because just overall vehicle emission standards have been constantly made more strict over time. Platinum is also, once again, necessary for computers, though in a different way than gold and silver. Platinum composes part of the recording layer of hard drive disks, along with cobalt into which are embedded the magnetic nanograins, whose alignment of which is actually what determines the recording of the data. And also as well in many machines for their own internal temperature monitoring, tiny little platinum instruments, platinum sensors monitoring temperature via variations in the electric current flowing through it, as platinum's electric resistance will actually alter and change based on the temperature. It's also used in another catalyst form, consumed in countless chemical synthesis processes, used in the process of creating many different kinds of medicines, creating fertilizers, waterproof materials, shampoo even. It's also back in your car once again, as it's needed in tiny percentages in the alloy of vehicle spark plugs. And platinum is mixed in at micro to nanoscopic levels in special kinds of fiberglass. The kind needed for the fiber optic cables that allow the existence of the internet and our modern communication infrastructure. Now, finally on to palladium. Also, as mentioned, having its largest amounts of consumption based in the making of catalytic converters, as well as also being used in many chemical synthesis processes as a catalyst as well, used to catalyze the reactions that produce everything from dyes and coloring agents, paints, to styrofoam, to many different kinds of medicines, to plastic, rubber, and so many other things. The palladium catalyst range is extremely vast. It's also, once again, needed for computers and electronics, but once again in a different way. We need palladium along with tantalum to make capacitors, little electronic components that temporarily store electric charge. They're kind of like auto-activated micro-batteries. 
they store tiny bits of electric charge and immediately release it whenever there's an interruption in any of the current in their part of the circuit board. And capacitors fill those tiny gaps so that they don't actually really appear, and thus so your device doesn't spontaneously fail every other minute. Now we will move on to the final member, rhodium, the one that almost no one ever knows about. Rhodium is also hugely consumed in the production of catalytic converters. Who knew? However, when it comes to its other uses, it differs a bit from platinum and palladium. Rhodium finds its first critical need in the spark plugs of aircraft. Yes, airplanes have spark plugs as well, as well as also being needed in large, bright, focused lights. Lights such as searchlights, spotlights, and the biggest source of that type of consumption in particular, vehicle headlights. As well as being alloyed, granted in very minuscule amounts, in heating elements, or electric heating coils, as well as furnace windings. And in its own electronics applications, rhodium finds itself needed in a very specialized area in proximity sensors. And that is the greater part of the large array of critical ways in which we actually depend on the precious metals for the very world itself in which we now live, and the ease and quality of life which we're now able to enjoy. Far more than just the aimless jewelry upon which we've always wasted and even still waste them to make today. Along with, of course, our inescapable dependency on petroleum, a video about that and the true depth of which you can find a link to appearing up in the corner here. But apart from that, this is about it for this video here. So thank you absolutely everybody for sticking around and watching this whole thing. Please like the video if you enjoyed learning everything. Subscribe to the channel if you want to see more things like this. Also, please consider donating to help keep me alive, literally, as I'm losing my job in January. But anyway, regardless of what becomes of me, God bless you all, and I will see you all again next time.